me alone. Stick to something you know about. Listen, my daughter was about your age. Then she met a guy like you. Now she's dead. <laughs> you still believe in ghosts, pea brain? Hello and welcome to Hello, This is the Doomed Show. I am Richard. I paused for some reason because I wasn't sure who I am. And uh, I am very, very honored to be doing not only a different episode, but I'm really, really stoked to have this co-host extraordinaire special. That's my official title for Duncan McLeish of the podcast Under the Stairs and 90 other shows. Duncan, hello. Hi, Richard. Uh, oh, this is, I mean, this has been a long... I think we've been talking about me coming across to do Dim Show for uh, four <laughs> years. <laughs> yes. Something ludicrous. Mm -hmm. We got it together. We did it. <laughs> Yay. And that's, that's the whole show, just to have you say hi. Yeah. <laughs> No, I uh, I have tasked Duncan, uh, before I let him rampage over your ears about all the shows he does, because I want, this is the Duncan promo segment, but we also talk about movies. I thought of a topic of pure, unadulterated, frickin' nostalgia. <laughs> We're going to talk about, each of us have picked five films mm -hmm. that made us into the horror movie maniacs that we are today and i am really excited i thought of something to talk about because this would have been <laughs> heckin awkward we were talking about this just before we hit record i i used to do when i started podcasting i used to do loads of guest appearances because i'm a whore for mm. attention um Oh, I was just like yeah. I, also a whore, obviously. So, Yay! Yeah, uh, reasonable rates, um, and I, uh, I I don't get as many requests nowadays. Um, and when I do, it tends to be similarly themed on my appearances. They all tend to opt for things they've heard me talk about before for some reason, and then they want mm. that in their episode. And I'm like, well, <laughs> just rip the audio from the other one and put it in. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's that point where I'm like, there's only so much I can say about this movie. So the fact you've you've challenged me with something... like To be honest, I hadn't even considered this. Like, in general, movies... I do, like, a subset on my show where I, I look at movies that influenced interests yeah. in my taste. You know, like, th this is the movie that got me into film footage. This is the movie that got me into so th that sort of idea. But to actually chart movies that specifically are like, oh, well, that's a milestone for my horror interest right there. Never done that before. So, yeah, um, I've maybe spent a bit too long, <laughs> like, like yeah. going over this going... did. I mean, this feels like an obvious choice, but is this the right one? Is this the right movie? <laughs> I did the same thing. Well, as you know, I am uh, criminally nostalgic. <laughs> I really, really get carried away. I mean, my like, I have a whole book mm -hmm. that's basically me trying to uh, plumb the depths of my, my childhood uh, because, I mean, it was pretty great. I was just like... <laughs> Big shocker, now that I'm a podcaster, I didn't have a lot of friends. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Have you seen that meme where it's the like what it feels like to listen to podcasts? Yeah, it's the kid, it's the kid enjoying the his ice cream and talking yeah, yeah. to the three girls in the picture. <laughs> literally me. That was me. We, we, we joked about this recently um, on a different show that I do. I was talking about how um, laxed licensing laws for alcohol where I lived. Uh, not laws in general. Ooh. The laws were fairly strict but the shop kind of local shop that sold alcohol close to where I lived was fairly laxed on who they sold to and um, mm. I had mentioned that you know from about the age of 14 I could I I could be sold alcohol, and um, oh the person, yeah, from the person, Scotland as well. Which I mean, there's a there's a there's a culture of alcohol here. Um, <laughs> but, oh um, no! In the conversation, what had come up was uh, one of the guys I was recording was like, "Oh, did you like? Were you buying like a bottle of red wine and going back to your room and and you know." Oh, I'll read some Edgar Allan Poe, and I'm like, well, it wasn't Edgar Allan Poe; it was Stephen <laughs> King. I'll have you know, um, Stephen King and Lovecraft. So, 
there is a bit of that where I think, yeah, I could go outside in the sunshine and chat to other people, or I could sit in here and watch movies. I know, yeah. I still do that. <laughs> like people were like, the pandemic, no, it means social contact's going to go away, and I was like, I've been preparing for this my, my entire whole life. life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This was uh, the. Uh, I mean, I'm already really awkward around people, so it it did not affect <laughs> how how I am whatsoever. Like, uh, yeah, it's, I'll be I'll be fine. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So I thought let's let's get all Duncan up in this bitch. I would like you mm-hmm. to do your five movies, so we can have like a narrative of, of this thing going. So yep. I'll, you'll do your five, I'll do mine, and we'll see who wins. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm just kidding. When you talk about horror movies, no one wins. <laughs> right. Um, so the first one is arguably not a horror movie, uh, but it it did absolutely break my brain when I saw it. Kind of very late 80s. Now, I'd already by then seen quite a lot of stuff. I think I was about, what, I would have been about eight, seven, eight, when I saw my first proper, proper horror movie, as in like okay. Maniac Cop, um, and that was Bad Babysitter. And then from there, I was like, like obsessed with with horror movies, and it was all things like Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the Thirteenth, all your usual fare. Um, and then in my early teens, uh, it was kind of bootlegged video nasties, uh, which were on kind of hand me down VHS. So it was like Cannibal Holocaust. I spit in your grave like at twelve. So I, I was already kind of ingrained. However, there was this movie in particular. I, I hold very close to my heart. And that the first time I saw it, my fragile little brain broke because I couldn't understand the majority of what was going on. And there's a reason behind that. So I've, I've opted for a movie from 1986. Um, this one is directed by and written by David Lynch. And it's Blue oh, Velvet. Shit. Oh, my God. Now, Blue Velvet isn't a horror movie, but you could argue that there are scenes in the movie that are absolutely terrifying. And most of them involve Dennis Hopper. <laughs> like, <laughs> Dennis Hopper and a giant vat of ether. Mm. Um, so yeah, this movie, I, this is my first Lynch movie. So this is before I even actually yep. knew who David Lynch was. Same and here. I got into Twin Peaks when Twin Peaks came on TV, early 90s. And that's how I knew David Lynch. And I never equated it back, which is weird because it's obviously a continuation. Um, but this particular movie, I think it was the first time I'd watched a movie which had a questionable narrative structure and really kind of toyed with the idea of this is perception, this is how reality perceives things, but this is what people are doing behind closed doors. And that that to me was became a a, a bit more of a <laughs> a bit more of a like terrifying to watch terrifying thing to watch. Um there is some male on female violence which I'd never really seen done in this capacity. In slasher movies, it's always, oh the killer stalking the woman. Oh she's went downstairs. Right. Oh she's dead straight away. And this one it was it was actual proper physical violence. Um and then there's also that slight weird lynching line of whether or not Isabella Rossellini's actually if this is something she gets off on, or if this is, you know, has she has she molded this experience because yes. she's quite like, and it's, but it's never like Lynch. Surprise, surprise! Uh, never expressly like reveals anything to do with anything about it. It's just kind of, no. and weirdly, actually, in a movie like Blue Velvet, I think that is more true to life. I I think some people. I think there is a duality amongst everyone where, you know, there's the the face that people see and then there's the person that you really are. Um, And few people will get to know the person that you really are. Most people will get to know the face that you you put on when you go out and speak to people. And I think this movie, granted it is nuts, um, is one where I, I, I found that idea as being probably more on point but also something I couldn't fathom at the age of nine like at the age of nine the face that you see is the person you are it's like over time you you understand that you have to mold something different um so I I just there was just so many scenes that just kind of broke my brain like you have like that incredible scene of uh, Dean Stockwell singing (laughs) um oh yeah 
like to iconic a light bulb. shot of the movie. Yeah, yeah, to a light bulb, and he's not even singing; he's he's miming. He's like he's lip syncing to to this um to his light bulb, and watching it going, I don't understand what we're doing here. That like trying to fathom what is going on with Frank Booth as a character is you know almost mind breaking as well. And then you have the idea of Jeffrey Beaumont, like Kyle McLaughlin's character, like specifically starting off as a kind of good wholesome you know, well-to-do kid on the street. But even towards the end of the movie, he becomes a bit abusive and he starts that line, like his experience and time with with Frank Booth and specifically with Do- uh, Dorothy as played by Isabella Rossellini starts to bring out a darkness in him as well. And the weird thing about it is it's a movie that doesn't really necessarily have a like an A to B to C narrative. Like there's an ear filmed at the beginning <laughs> we will eventually find out who the year belonged to, but that journey and like an old classic noir, um, which was a subgenre that I I got into after this, is you start off somewhere, you end up in a completely different mystery, which takes you off in a different direction. You may yep. solve this crime, but where your character ends up at the end is somewhere pretty tragic. Um, yeah, I, I like it's like I say, it's not a horror movie, but I think. Oh man! I mean, the many times I've seen, you know top 50 like horror scenes in movies blue velvet is always on <laughs> it's always yeah, on one yeah. of those lists um yeah that's that's where i started because to me see you were nine me. yeah when you i were... saw blue velvet i was nine okay because um, i was traumatized by it too but i was 20 oh so <laughs> i can only imagine what your brain went through that's i couldn't understand crazy. the majority of the movie <clears throat> so probably for the like, best you know what I mean? That's that's the interesting thing about Blue Velvet is I've watched it several times now and I think about what my nine-year-old brain made of the movie compared to what my almost 40-year-old brain now makes of that movie. <laughs> and it's completely different, but it's still a very uncomfortable watch regardless how old yeah. I am. The messaging's different. My brain's, like, I, I would argue, slightly more matured to the point where I understand some more of the themes. I understand the sexual violence, which I didn't understand as a kid. Um, and that makes me more uncomfortable, whereas... When I was a kid, the sexual violence didn't make me uncomfortable. It was more, there's a severed deer in the grass. Yeah. And I need to work it out. And this guy's absolutely terrifying. And what is in that mask that he keeps huffing? That's yeah. like, and so it's, and I think that's the, it, it kind of started my fascination with Lynch overall. Um, because I think, like, you can grow into his movies. Whereas, like, I've watched Maniac Cop a million times. It was my first proper horror movie that I watched. The messaging's never really changed on Maniac Cop. No, no. <laughs> you know what you I mean? Whereas <laughs> with Lynch, I feel like I've grown up with that movie. Um, still don't know if I'm interpreting it right, but there's something, there's something wholly interesting. And it did make me... Had I not seen Blue Velvet when I did, I don't think I would have been ready to... And this is a weird conflation but i don't think i would have necessarily been ready to watch movies like faces of death you know i spit in your grave well it's stuff that i saw mm. in my Understood. early teens um and that i like it almost kind of broke my brain a little bit and it set me up for right i might not understand movies but i can still watch them Whereas if all I'd watched is A Nightmare on Elm Street uh, and then I watched I Spit Your Grave, I'd be like, what is this filth? Burn it! Burn it! Like, so I think there's a, you know, there's a part, there's a part that kind of molded it a little bit. So that was my first one. Very nice. I love it. Yeah, I picked up uh, Blue Velvet on VHS when the, the video store near me was going out of business. Mm-hmm. And it was I bought that in Exorcist 3. Oh my uh, and God. I, I had never seen either film. And you know how it is back in the day when you only own like eight movies mm-hmm. on tape, you tend to just rewatch the same shit over and over again. And I must have watched Blue Velvet and Exorcist Three like a thousand times. <laughs> my mom, my mom doesn't remember shit about like me as a kid, other than when I was being a dick. <laughs> and, but she remembers vividly watching Blue Velvet with me. Oh god! At some point, I made my mother watch Blue Velvet with me. I think that was when. Uh, we both decided I should move out. <laughs> <laughs> it was time. It was overdue. Go. You need to go. <laughs> I used to 
to get like super embarrassed if someone kissed someone else on TV while sitting oh, yeah. in the room with my mother. I can't imagine how <laughs> Daddy wants to fuck um, would have went down, and I I, I can just uh, I mean that's oh terrifying, <laughs> so. dude. I I really my, well, my parents were the sexy comedy people. They rented every sex comedy oh, that nice. came out when it was new and would watch it with me mm-hmm. with my mom covering my eyes during all the <laughs> sexy parts and that's why i'm such a neuter now because of all those horrible experiences <laughs> i've gone on about this so much on the show it's people know they everyone knows <laughs> but let, let's let's say uh, let's link up my, my my second choice it's also yes. interestingly enough same year i kind of stress to people that they get to know me over time and my film choices that I I enjoy movies that have kind of happy endings for the most part, but I I lean more towards the movies that don't. You know, the movies that have a kind of more nihilistic uh, kind of uh, kind of sense of finality at the end. Like, I mean, my, one my, one of my all time favorite horror movies is The Thing, and The Thing ends up mm-hmm. in a position where most likely. Um, the creature escapes and the world is doomed. So, I mean, that is a, you know, maybe, you know, there's a maybe uh, kind of possibility <laughs> at the end of that movie. But I wasn't always that way. So, like, like slasher movies always had that kind of jump at the end where, oh, the right. killers, but then most of them in the sequel would play that off as a, oh, well, it was a, a dream. Like, Friday the 13th is a great example of that. It was always it would always end with the, the killer's back, and then the next movie would stop. It would be like, kidding! You know what I mean? It was only a dream the character was having. <laughs> the first movie that I was fully aware, and that you could say this has a happy ending, but it really doesn't. The happy ending is that the the protagonist is a broken character at the end. Um and this is one of my all-time favorite movies. This is my top ten movies of all time. It's directed by Richard, uh, sorry, Robert Harmon, uh, written by Eric Reed, and it's The Hitcher. Uh, Ooh. Yeah, I fucking love this movie. Absolutely nice. love this movie. Um, I think it's like it's about to get a. It's about to finally get a proper Blu-ray treatment um, this year, which I can't... Well, I say this year. It's a NIMS for this year, uh, which I can't wait to own because this, like, it is beautifully shot, but it is a movie which I think is the purest sort of horror um, that you can get, which is... It's the kind of classic, you pick up a hitchhiker and that hitchhiker turns out to be a maniac. Well, that's what it is at its core, but what it has in, in speeds is Ruger Her, who is like is like what is like you, you constantly throughout this movie is what is wrong with this guy all the way through this movie <laughs> what is wrong with this guy and the movie at no point ever gives you backstory to that the closest you get to his backstory is the car with murdered people that you see right at the start that you drive past um that is that's the extent of it so you never really find out who he is, why he's done what he's done, which every other movie kind of almost espouses by trying to tell you, oh, well, it's a troubled household he came from, or, you know, like, it is, it's essentially, it's a, it's a road movie slasher, which we hadn't really had before. Slashers were all kind of grounded in, you know, he's a killer from Crystal Lake, he's a maniac from Haddonfield, he's like, we, we had these set locations and the kind of legend that went along with the killer. And this movie removed all that, and it just made there's a unstoppable like regardless of what you're trying to do this guy is nigh on unstoppable and he has <laughs> no motivation at, well yeah his only motivation in the movie is you picked him up that is it that is the, that's where the target comes in and the levels to which he goes to in the movie to essentially destroy C. Thomas Hill which he does in this movie um, he gets in his break. There's a, a a scene that scarred me as a kid uh, in this movie where, and it's all to do with trauma. Um, he gets away from John Ryder's character, kind of not relatively at all, maybe 20, 30 minutes into the movie, and he gets to a diner and he gets a plate of chips. And as he's eating the chips, he lifts up a severed finger. Yep. Which, oh, yeah. Which, and then, but the indication in his brain is. 
Is that actually a severed finger that he's picked up or is the, the trauma manifesting a fake image of a severed finger? Is it how he's, he's picked, you know, is it or isn't it there? Is this kind of PTSD from the, the effect? And I just love that as a, as a kid because it's the stuff that nightmares are made of. It's yeah, and I, I I love it right like right to even at the end where you know C. Thomas Hill eventually gets the, he's, he gets the upper hand and puts Ryder down. His characters, you know, that as a character he's ruined from then on, very much like uh, you know the end of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Where you have yeah. a, like screaming as it, or the end of Tenebrae, where you know, uh, Daria Nicolodi is screaming in horror as the credits oh come over. God, you know what I mean? That is that, scream. It's just that idea of trauma, just like like pure trauma, and that's that's all that John John Ryder gets off on fear, and at the end he wins by dying. It's such a, it's like seven. You know what I mean? It's like such a, you know, John Doe's got the upper hand. Um, I I thought, I, I, it still is up there. It's, to me, it's one of those, this movie has such a basic premise, has amazing cinematography, has one of the greatest on-screen villains of all time and genuinely was terrifying. I don't pick up Hitchhikers. Not that I live no. in an area that you could pick up Hitchhikers, no. but I think one of the reasons that would put me off it is this movie. <laughs> I live in Florida. Of course I don't pick up anybody. <laughs> a Florida God. man. Um, yeah, exactly. But yeah, it's, um, yeah I think it's... I, I, I genuinely think it is, is one of the best. And this is another movie that doesn't get lumped in horror. It's more classed as a thriller. This is a horror movie. Um, yeah. 100%. But yeah, it, I like genuinely... Once again, kind of what my it made me want more movies where characters were broken at the end or villains win. Because of the two characters, <laughs> the far more interesting character in this movie is John Ryder. Of course, he's the you know he's like you don't you want to see Jim Halsey get out of it, but at the same point you want John Ryder back on the screen chasing them. And there's a there's a sadisticness as the audience to want that to want to keep putting this character in peril so the villain comes back. And it's slasher movies. That's essentially what slashers do. But I I would watch this before I watch a slasher movie. So. I shamefully have not seen that in like probably 20 years. Oh wow. It has been a long time and about that's a that's that's on me. I need I you are got you've got me all fired up now so <laughs> excellent excellent choice. I love it. Uh, right, third one. Once again like I I am going to jump into more contemporary movies but my third movie sure. is I'm a big Clyde Barker fan. Love Clyde Barker. Um and I I'm a big David Cronenberg fan. Uh, so when you put those two people together in a movie, um, <laughs> like Nightbreed, I get really excited. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, I, I love Nightbreed. Uh, Nightbreed, once again, is, and you mentioned it before, I wasn't exactly the most popular person as a kid. Um, read the horror books, watched horror movies, uh, listened to metal music in a country which didn't really have kids listening to metal music um, and just like had a dark sense of humour like, like wherever I walked there was a grey cloud above me um, <laughs> goth before goth was cool uh, and Nightbreed was made for me like Nightbreed was made for me a movie that kind of even though it's butchered by the studio kind of espouses that the monsters are the good guys um, is is kind of something I I wanted to believe. I'd already read Cabal, the the book that is based on, or the novella that is based on, before I saw this one. And even though it came out in nineteen ninety, I want to say it was like ninety three, ninety four before I finally saw this movie. So that would have been about the time I would have just been starting high school or there or thereabouts. And I remember like renting Nightbreed, and I must have like. I must have got this movie out so many times um, from the video <laughs> store. And every time I watched it, I loved it a little bit more. I think, it, once again, it has one of my favourite on-screen villains of all time. Dr. Decker is... 
So scary. Oh he's, my God. he's it's like David Cronenberg is already kind of terrifying. Like if you look, yes. he's, he's already like if you ever hear him talk, he's just a little bit too clinical about everything he does, uh, <laughs> and just a little bit detached. And his cinema is like he's one of my. Uh, if I had a Mount Rushmore of directors, Cronenberg is in that Mount Rushmore. Um, but this is the first time I was aware that this guy just by his appearance and the way he speaks is terrifying. You give him a knife, he's even more terrifying. Um, he's just a great villain. Uh, and I love the kind of idea of the the psychiatrist, the guy who's charged to help the person is actually the guy who's, you know, the killer. And uh, he's, you know, if anything, he's prepped and out here by hypnotising this guy to take the fall. Um but all the creature work, like the idea and the concept of Midian being a, a location for, for outcasts, it's where the monsters live. I loved that. I absolutely loved it. Um, and then, the you know, towards the big battle at the end where you have essentially the outcasts versus the the, the police and the army and God knows who else is there. Um, <laughs> it just, it, it, it kind of spoke to me. I think like Nightbreed is the sort of movie that kind of makes you, kind of almost like the filmmaker, Clyde Barker himself saying, you know, it's okay to be an outcast. It's okay to be like a monster, quote unquote, or like monsters because wherever you are, the, like whatever your interests are, there, and it's even more, now with the internet, whatever your interests are, whatever your niche is, that niche is shared by other people. There are like-minded right. individuals out there, and you can connect, um, which is evident from from horror podcasting. Because I was the only guy that was into horror as a kid, but now I, you know, there are so many groups and pages and podcasts and people and friends that I made through doing it. And I think in some weird way, Nightbreed may have prepped me for that. <laughs> like, Nightbreed may have been like the filmic <laughs> version of, you'll find your scene, you'll find you'll your find crowd. find your Midian, yeah. Yeah, you will find your Midian. Your Midian might be on iTunes as a podcast. <laughs> uh, but as you know, as it, it, it is out there and you can find it. And I think that's kind of cool. Like, I, I, it's, it's kind of stuck with me um, since watching it that, it's a movie. It's like it's chicken soup for the soul for me. Like uh, Nightbreed is a movie I can put on any time and watch it. I pr- I can practically recite every word in it. Nice. Um, but it's that movie nice. that between that and Pieces, I think those two movies are movies that, regardless what mood I'm in, I could put them on and I would be happy with them being on. So, of course. Um, yeah, I remember when when Nightbreed came out and it was mind blowing. And I, um, because I think I was fourteen when that came out. And I immediately bought Cabal to read, mm-hmm. and I was just shocked by how amazing the book is, and how the there's so many like perfectly, like scri- like from page to screen moments, not not real, not even having a clue that you know Clive Barker, who wrote the book, mm-hmm. might have had something to do with the movie. <laughs> yeah, though well, he basically yeah. the, the the story behind that's the, the the stories behind that production are phenomenal. So Clyde Barker wrote Cabal whilst directing Hellraiser. He wrote it on wow. the set. So that he was he wow. was he was filming his own novel and writing a book which he then intended to option and direct. So when he went to direct Nightbreed it was because he'd already, while he was writing it, he was in filmmaking mode. So that's why it transcends. And then on the flip side of that, whilst whilst Cronenberg is on set, Cronenberg is writing the script for Naked Lunch. So, oh my God. which he went on and did right after. And it's just that's like so cool. the, the, the creative bubble that exists in that short time period God. for those movies is just is, is mind blown. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's one of those ones that, like I say, it it has to make my list. It might not necessarily be a scary movie, but it's one that holds a place close to my heart. The next movie is a scary movie. <laughs> like, oh yeah, let's do it. Yeah, right. So this one I didn't see until two thousand and two thousand, um, and I think I saw this because the third installment had just been released, and it was a prequel. Um, this is um, a Japanese movie which was made in 1998 and it's called uh, Ring or Ringu. <gasps> oh. 
This movie's terrifying. <laughs> yes. For, for lack of a better word. Uh, I never see... Like, I was a hardcore horror fan. Like, proper hardcore horror fan. I By the time 2000 swings around, I just started working in a video store. And I remember this movie, like, being on the shelf. And I where I worked, the video store was close to a university that had a film like film wing so to speak so we had lots of film students who would come in and you would get you would get great conversation with them specifically about movies you know they would come in and tell you oh, this is a great movie you check that have you like you would just chat about stuff and i i don't know what it was that always put me off checking the movie i think it's interestingly enough it'll lead in a conversation we had off off air about hype um yeah oh, i yeah. never met anyone that didn't tell me like Ringu was a terrifying movie and as a result of that I kind of put off watching it from from hype um and I I distinctly remember getting all three movies taking them home and I I suffer pretty bad insomnia so my plan was I'm going to do the trilogy I'm going to do them in order um of uh, you know chronological order as opposed to release date order so I watched oh, uh, Ring okay. Zero first and Ring Zero does not set you up for Ring at all because it is a lot more whimsical and romantic. Um, huh. I hadn't thought of that. That's a good point. Yeah, well, it's, it, it doesn't... It was based on the whole setup to the... T- so it's all Sadako's life at school. And it is... It's got, like, a weird love story in it. And it only really starts to become a horror movie towards the end. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, it was maybe about two in the morning by the time I'm sitting down to watch Ringu and I'm like, let's do this. <laughs> and instantly, instantly, everything about it just put my my, my kind of my skin just a little bit too tight and on edge. Um, oh, it's, it's shot very grainy. The sound design is so clever and that all yes. the way through it, you constantly think something's going to go wrong. Uh, the tape itself is... So, like so this is the one thing I think the American remake gets wrong because the American remake puts a lot of imagery in it that is like I think there's a scene with a, a nail and a, a, a like a, a nail going through a nail so an actual physical nail that you would hammer into wood going through right. someone's nail so they put like a lot of shots that would make you uncomfortable whereas in the Japanese movie it's just a lot of it's like a ladder like a why is there a ladder against the building there's a lot of weird shit in there but with the ominous music yeah. it's just it's, it's, there's just something really unsettling about it and I was I was on edge all the way through this movie um, the scene in the well where she's climbing up I, like I did, like fucking terrified me um, just everything about it and then I remember thinking, "All oh, right, well, she solved it. She saved the day. They buried the girl. We are mm-hmm. fine. We are, we yep. are fucking golden here." And then <laughs> her understanding too late that it's not about the body. It's not about laying at rest. It's the the idea of spreading the the curse on, passing the curse on, so to speak. And then. And I knew nothing about the movie as well, so I didn't know the end. Uh, and then sitting oh, in my man. bedroom watching, because this was like this is on VHS, which I mean, oh, once again, no. so like the time period is just perfect for this movie. You're oh. watching a movie about a cursed videotape whilst watching it on a videotape. Yeah. Um, mm. And my TV oh. was a small TV, like the guy had in there, and it's just so so fucking clever. And when she crawls out the TV, I shit you not, there are maybe about three or four movies ever, I mean ever, that I've had to switch off when something's happened. And this was one of them. Um, oh, wow. I had to hit stop. I had to switch the lights on in my bedroom, listen to a bit of Wham, <laughs> and a little bit of Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go to put some joy back into my life before I hit, before I hit play back on it again. And I, I have watched this movie several times, uh, several times since, and even though I know that bit is coming up, the fact it's done practically, the fact like the actress moves that particular way, there's no digital fuckery with it. Mm-hmm. It's all done yep. organically. 
Oh, it is God. some of the most unsettling. It's some of the most unsettling. And it's such a simple thing. It's such a simple technique to do. And in the hands of a really creative filmmaker, in a really clever script with a nice twist. Um, yeah, this this movie, like it almost reset the kind of barometer for me on what was scary. Like what quantifies as a scary horror film. And it, it in resetting it, it like moved up to a level that few movies have hit since um I, I have the ring test when it comes to movies now does this movie make me feel like i felt like when i watched the ring D- does this scene scare me the way i was before and few movies reach it so yeah the ring yeah the remake is one of those rare remakes mm-hmm. where they americanize something without yep. making it stupider you know that has to spell shit out but it doesn't do like the, you know that travesty of like the pulse remake yeah yeah where they blew it completely uh but liette and i were dating mm-hmm. in 2002 and we went and saw that and that wrecked our shit <laughs> because all i knew was it was about a cursed videotape yeah I, you know i just knew i was into horror i was back into horror in the early 2000s that's when my like my uh, horror resurgence came and seeing that and clutching my my future wife in the dark, like waiting for death, because they hype this videotape up that it's gonna kill you. Mm-hmm. Then they fucking show it to you, yeah. And that in your brain is so perfect. That's why when I finally did watch the Japanese one, you know, knowing what was gonna happen and everything, it did not scare me mm-hmm. at all. Yeah, but. That's the one I come back to over and over again. That's the one I'm willing to put up with the nightmare of a, an arrow sale yeah. <laughs> and wait 30 days for a box set, which is perfectly reasonable to a normal person, perfectly reasonable for one of the most popular Blu-ray companies on the planet mm-hmm. to have to take 30 days to get you something. It's fine. What's not fine is me, as, who's a psycho, like staring at my mailbox with rage because I'm an idiot. But anyway. <laughs> the Ringu itself is such a masterpiece. Like, why that didn't skip Arrow and go straight to Criterion, I don't know. It's strange. It's a strange one. There's a there's a weird... It's not stigma. It was to do with a lot... I think a lot of it's to do with the original distributors. So, um, okay. you'll remember this, uh, but the, the company that put out the majority of Asian horror movies late 90s to mid 2000s was a company called uh, Tartan and they had a, yeah. they had it was Tartan Asia Extreme was the name of the label they had and oh, it's so yes so purpose was taking Asian horror movies and putting them out and um the i think there are certain labels that will overlook like a Tartan Asia Extreme because on that label you have movies like you know, Ringu, but you will also have movies like Photograph, which are which is not a good Asian horror movie. Um, you know what I mean? Or, <laughs> yeah. or, or, or like things like Ichi the Killer, which I mean is like, like gloriously violent, but because that's out in the same label, I think a Criterion is like, uh, yeah, uh, that's that's whereas not fair, Arrow, but yeah, like, I get it. Gimme, 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 uh, <laughs> like gimme it all. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, I, I I don't know. And what's the interesting story I found speaking to Americans a lot through podcasting is almost identically to what you've just said. They saw the American version first. Yep, as a exactly. result, when they saw, saw the Japanese version, it didn't scare them as much. However, when they are rewatching, they tend to lift the Japanese version up before the American version, which mm-hmm. uh, to me is so... Uh, that's so cool, but at the same time, it's so bizarre. Like you, cause it's, mo- most of your nostalgia is built in on the first right. watch of the first one as opposed to the... The original, so... It's also a little sad, because, you know, it's like, I know I would have had your reaction mm. yeah. when you watched the original, because it's it's the concept, and like you said, Hideo Nakata, the director, like, he, he was firing on all cylinders, and the crew, and the cast, or everything comes together so perfectly, which is why, you know, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, people are still going to be talking about... Ringu in uh, you know up against things like Hausu 
and yeah. and things like um Qui Don. Uh, yeah, 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 or even things like I uh, uh, say because you can see on like the Criterion Collection they have things like Kuroneko or Onibaba and you know stuff mm-hmm. like that where they specifically have these these kind of Japanese ghost stories from like the sixties and seventies and then you're like but I mean that's essential. All all Ringu is is updated for a modern age. It's still right. a it's still a ghost story. All it's doing is it's grounding it in with the technology of the time. That's why, like movies like Pulse, the first time you watch Pulse, um, oh it, shit, it's, it's, it's I mean that is like don't don't bother like speaking to loved ones at the end. You know what I mean? It's it's such a such a horrifically depressing movie, which yeah. is. It's full of. It's when people say, "Oh, you know, I didn't really get it," and I'm like, "Well, one, maybe you're not supposed to get it because you're not in Japanese society." But that's the fear. The fear over there is you die alone. <laughs> like, like, yeah. it's, it, like people live on top of each other in Tokyo to the point that you have a neighbor that you never see, you never speak to. You can go through your. I saw a news report recently where it was one of these things where they were talking about lockdown. It was a guy in Japan who had lived alone with no human contact at all. He was a software developer, makes his own computer games, but lived in his own little apartment for 15 years. Like 15 oh years, he gets, he gets food delivered to him. He doesn't, you know, he does it all online, but he doesn't speak to the people delivering his food. He has no contact with the outside world, which isn't in video calls now, but would have been phone calls back then. Um, he has a routine that he follows every single day. It's like something from like I Am Legend. He gets up in the morning, <laughs> you know, does his uh, does some tai chi, uh, does his exercises, sits, works, gets some lunch, um, you know, reads a little, meditates, like all the rest. Has lived exactly the same way for for essentially like 10, 10 plus years doing wow. that. No, no, but but he lives in Tokyo. So it's not as if he lives in the middle of nowhere. He lives <laughs> in an apartment building in Tokyo. One and, of the most crowded cities on earth. Yeah, and so he does but he doesn't speak to his neighbours. He doesn't know who his neighbours are, doesn't have any contact with anyone. When you watch a movie like Pulse, at that point you're like, this is what they're talking this is what they're talking about. Yeah. Um and it's something terrifying. It's just an update for them, which I I, I find I find really interesting. Um, let me give you my final one. So we're going yeah. to we're moving up into kind of up to date territory here. All right. Um, I mean, this once again shouldn't surprise anyone really. Um, I think this movie is kind of amazing, uh, just because there's a whole wave of. I don't want to use the word smarter horror movies because I even I roll at that, but just like really interestingly made horror movies. Um, and this one is one of the better ones of the last five years. Um, Hereditary uh, is, my, oh is my final pick, directed by and written by Ari Aster, who went on to do Midsommar, uh, which was almost the movie that I picked for this point. I was having a debate amongst which Ari Aster movie do I pick as my final one? This, to me, is the epitome of everything that's exciting in horror cinema now. Um, it's also one of the clear indications of how polarising horror fandom is at the moment. <laughs> it's like This is a, like it's very much a tentpole, kind of in the ground, right, we're drawing a line in the sand here, you're either on the side of hereditary or you're on the side of hereditary is everything that's wrong with horror. Um, <laughs> the reason behind it is, yes, it's full of, it's full of scenes of horror, but it's, it, you know, very much like The Exorcist and William Friedkin saying, like, The Exorcist isn't a horror movie, it's a family drama. And we're like, yep, exactly. Friedkin. Nice, yes. nice, thanks for that. Yeah, it's terrifying. <laughs> but th- th- thank you thank you William Friedkin um, Hereditary is exactly the same Hereditary is a movie which for all intents and purposes is about a very dysfunctional family but it just so happens to have scenes of absolute horror um, in it it's, it's a movie that really labours in the discomfort of 
awkward situations, like awkward conversations. Conversations that if you were sitting on the couch and you were looking over at two people having a hereditary-esque conversation, you would likely want the couch to swallow you or leave the room. It's just like, it's and it's so, like emotionally it is a raw movie to watch. I think like Ari Aster is really good at capturing raw kind of emotions. But I saw this movie three times at the cinema. Uh, oh, the, wow. All three times I saw it in the cinema, it was sold out. All three times, wow. this, the scene where the girl's head smacks the pole, uh, which you don't see, you could have heard a fucking pin drop. Or as I like yeah. to say, you could, have, you could have heard a rat piss on cotton in the cinema. Um, <laughs> that's how that's how quiet things got. Um, I'd like, <laughs> like deathly, deathly, deathly quiet. Um, however... All three watches of this in the cinema involved about a quarter of the cinema leaving during the runtime because they didn't enjoy it. So, like I say, and these are not, I don't even think these were, like, acclimated horror fans. These are just people that are like, you know, this is shit. Uh, I don't want to watch right, this. Right, right. Uh, and they get up and walk out. Um, I, I, the, the raw, It's the rawness of the movie before any of the horror scenes in the movie that actually get to me. Because I yeah. think... Like the scenario, like when you hear Tony Collette find you hear once again stress, you hear her find, you don't see her find. When you hear her find her dead daughter, and then you get like essentially like three minutes of her wailing on the ground, uh, saying that she wants to die, is that's horror, man. That is that is absolute. That is that is suffering and misery and trauma and horror all wrapped up in a scene that when the actual horror scenes themselves kick in they're not as horrific as the pain you've witnessed someone experience yeah. yeah but but then the movie like turns up a notch like the last the last like 20 minutes of this movie are pants shittingly scary <laughs> like where she is coming out of the shot there's a scene where he's in a room and there's a sh- it's shadows in the corner because it's a dark room and you can see her in the top corner. You can just make out her like like kind of propped up in the top corner of the, the ceiling. Oh my God. And yep. it's just like ter- like her screaming and running. And then the, the, the end of the movie, which people are like, I don't get the end of the movie. And I'm like, it's Rosemary's baby. <laughs> oh my God. It's, it's like, how can you not get it? It's all the way through the movie. <sighs> It's all the way through the movie. Like, this isn't all- like Suicide Club, yeah. where <laughs> even if you've watched it five or six times, you still know what the fuck the ending is you're, about. You're like, is it, so you know? w- were the band forcing people to kill themselves? No, no, they weren't. Like, well, Who are these they kids? Were. What? <laughs> Who are? i, I got to save these kids. Um, you know what I mean? Like, uh, well, it's the, 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 thing about, the thing about Hereditary is, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a big soapy hand job to a ton of 70s movies. <laughs> You know what I mean? It really, really is. It's a bit of Rosemary's Baby, <laughs> uh, Swoss Ingrid Bergman in there. You know what I mean? It's, oh like, it, it wears its influences 100% on its sleeve that I just assume, once again, I just assume when a movie like that finishes, everyone's on the same page as me. But it turns out, uh, no. Um, no, I, I like, no. And once again, it's another movie where, because it's the, it's the movie that people started associating the term prestige horror with, which is a term that I hate in general because I think yeah, it's, it's a horror lame. movie. It like it's it's a horror to me. Horror's horror. You know what I mean? It's a it's a horror movie. Now either it's a scary horror movie to you or it's not. It's a horror movie though. I don't think we need to elevate it because then that means I have to look back at movies made in the eight like as possession. You know, the Zosky movie, is that an elevated horror movie? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. is that a prestige horror movie? Or is right, it just a horror right. movie? I mean, it's doing the same thing that Hereditary is doing. It's taking the idea of grief and raw emotion and transcending it into, like, body horror, essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, I mean, we weren't using terms back then, so why do we feel the need to do that it, now? It, everything now has to be quantified has to have and, a label, and, yeah. and classified. Like, uh, we had to have the nightmare of something called torture porn, <laughs> which sadly that infected some filmmakers' minds. Yep. And then they went, oh, we're doing this. And that's when you get films like Slaughtered Vomit Dolls or like mm-hmm. other movies that l- literally 
I don't think would have been as crazy. I mean, maybe the filmmaker had something and then they had to express, but I really feel like it, it, it influenced the, the horror culture in a very negative way. Yep. Where there's so many films like that. Uh, my own little, uh, story of, of hereditary is, uh, my buddies, Marky and Carrie of the, the propyl, uh, they, went and saw hereditary without me. And this is when we were going to see everything together mm-hmm. because I just couldn't make it. And I was like, Oh, well, you know, would you want to go see it again? And they're like, fuck yes. <laughs> and so like the following weekend, they went and saw it again with me. And I didn't know that that movie had planted a seed in their very unusual brains. So they have a song about hereditary uh, from their band. Mm-hmm. And it is the chant at the end of the movie that all the gorgeous naked people are chanting. Yes. And that's the entire song. Oh, is them chanting. And for them, it's really catchy. Like, I mean, mm. they always sneak in these hooks in their songs that I'll never understand as long as I'm playing guitar. <laughs> but they are really great at sneaking in these hooks. But that whole song is the hook. Mm-hmm. And it gets on your nerves in the best way because you want to watch the movie yeah. after you hear it. And yeah, so I, I just, I love that I was there, at least partially there when they were like, I have an idea for a song. Oh, let me, let me do a proper Marky voice. I have an idea for a song. I think it'll make people's toenails curl back and wrap around their throats and maybe choke them, but in a good way. <laughs> He's not- one of those people I, I want everyone to meet. Marky is, I, if you listen to our, uh, our episode on, uh, Rob Zombie's Three from Hell to get a full blast of Marky. I, I will. I will do that now that you mentioned it. I think Ari Aster's like there's a there's an excitement to do with him as a filmmaker, and that like I say before, he's clearly referencing stuff. He's clearly like, he's clearly an educated film fan, but Absolutely. his movies are packed with detail. Like like on a second or a third watch of Hereditary. All the signs are there throughout the entire movie. And he, he puts them almost directly from the start. Like there's there's a, a clear indicator of exactly where things are going, which is why when Midsommar sprung around um, the following year, so he, like this, like less than a year after Hereditary what? came out, Midsommar came out. Um, wow, <laughs> how did he do that? Uh, when you watch that movie, it's exactly the same. In fact, Midsommar is even more egregious in that the tapestry that opens at the beginning of the movie shows you set pieces from the entire movie. Which, it I mean, it, it's like the, the, the balls on the guy just to go, you know... This is what you're going to watch, right? Sit down. So I, I, I love him as a filmmaker. I understand, like I said, I think the like you were saying, the the quantification of it, of putting it in that box, is what maybe puts off a lot of people because then you mm-hmm. have like what what the industry would like to have you believe, which are base level horror fans or you know like a basic bitch of a horror fan, um, <laughs> and as a result of that, they don't get it. And of course, that's in, that's instantly creating a divide where it's unnecessary. I think it is like you see those memes that come around that are like um there's two different types of horror fans and then there's like the guy that's all dressed up all like kind of nerd like sitting like all like quizzical and it's like those that like uh you know just like her- her- hereditary or the witch and it's like those that like sleepy away camp too. I yeah, yeah. yeah and I think that's an unfair divide because I totally. I love trash. I like I've, I've mentioned it before. Pieces is like chicken soup for the soul for me. I love trash, but it doesn't mean that I dislike watching, you know, movies that have a bit more subtext in them. But I know that there's plenty of people out there that just don't want that. They just want that they want that superficial level of horror, and that's cool because horror's a big enough tent that we can have all that. You can have movies that, that... And you can watch a Redditor on that level if you want, but we have all those different things. So Ari Aster, to me, is like... I, he, like There was plenty before, like the year before this, we had what well, Get Out, the year before that, we oh had God. The Witch, the year before that, yes. we had The Babadook. So things were trending that way of, this is the movie the critics really like, but the audience score isn't at the same level. Um, so we've just kept going along with that. But Hereditary yeah. for me is the the one where I'm like, every every now and again I'm like that. Uh, you know, have we peaked with the horror output? 
Um, <laughs> and Hereditary was the one where I was like that. Oh no, there's like there's a whole new series of. Ari Aster is not an old man. Like, there's a whole new series of filmmakers that are coming out there that are really exciting, that are wanting to push the boat out, and studios like an A24, for example, yeah. are prepared to take a gamble and release an over two hour horror movie, <laughs> which is mostly family drama. Um, yeah. Hey. So, yeah, it's, it, it's my last pick. To be honest, the, that final pick morphed between about 10 different movies that I could have talked about. Yeah. Um, and originally, because I thought it would be a ton of fun to talk about, the Suspiria remake was in there. Um, oh, baby. Well, but that's a me com- on that one. That's oh, yeah. a conversation for a different thing. <laughs> um, right, so that's my five, Richard. Great. Boone and Laurie, they were warned to stay away. Ain't nothing but dead folk. But didn't listen. Now, they're no longer lovers. For she's become the hunted. And he's become one of the night breed. From the creator of Hellraiser, Night Breed, rated R, starts Friday at theaters everywhere. Okay, it's time for my infinitely shittier list. <laughs> lies, lies. Richard. I also didn't put any thought into this bullshit. <laughs> no, I had a, I had a really tough time just narrowing this down to five. <laughs> Based on how long we're, we're going to go with mm. this episode, I'm really glad I narrowed it down to five. Yeah. <laughs> Back in the day, I was a little boy, and um, I had terrible trouble sleeping. Mm. Mainly, it was being terrified of going to school, because I got the lightest bullying. Like, <laughs> I got the most mild bullying ever, but I was such a weak kind of character anyway that I ended up being traumatized by just people making fun of my bell bottoms, which I still am mad about. My mother in 1983 or 84 sent me to school in a fresh pair of burgundy bell bottoms that she got at a garage sale. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you folks do not wear bell bottoms in 1984 to school. And that's when I learned to make fun of myself because I was being <laughs> relentlessly taunted about these bell bottoms. And they're like, hey, man, rock the bells, rock the bells. Because, you know, um, mm-hmm. good old uh, Run DMC was very yes. popular at the time. So I just started kicking my legs so that the bell bottoms would, would ring, like bounce back and forth on my ankles. And I would go, ding, ding, I'm rocking the bells. Ding, ding. <laughs> yeah, that's how I learned to make fun of myself before other people can. <laughs> and anyway... Um, so I would lay awake at night thinking of comebacks for bullies. I would be so funny and so smart. So I'd sit up all night with scenarios in my head of like what I would say or do to come back at people. And of course, those conversations never happened. Mm-hmm. And then I never had a chance to be such a freaking funny, awesome dude. <laughs> but that insomnia <laughs> caused by that uh, anxiety meant uh, I would just watch TV. Mm-hmm. And I would sneak my little TV and a, the, one of the films, um, a trio of films, but I narrowed it down to one uh, because it, it really is um, something that uh, speaks a lot about my tastes. So <laughs> uh, out of three films that I saw on my little tiny TV as a kid that stuck with me forever, there was um, a little film called uh, Prom Night, mm-hmm. which uh, Prom Night has always been one of my all-time favorites. Another one called Tourist Trap. Oh, I love Tourist Trap. Which is arguably the most interesting of the three, but that's not the one. The one that I saw around the same time when I was like eight (laughs) was Girls Night Out from from 1982. (laughs) The most derivative, most bizarre, and seriously half-assed, but wonderful slasher. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, also known as The Scare Maker, I believe, over in the UK. Yeah. The movie got to me and etched itself into my DNA that I am... I mean, I love Giallo, which, mm-hmm. of course, there's... there's Spoiler alert, there's a Giallo on this list. I love the Giallo, but slashers, especially pre-DVD, pre-1990... I'll even give it to 92 mm-hmm. or 93-ish. Mostly just pre-Scream slashers. Don't get me wrong. Love Scream. Love yep. the whole franchise. Love most of the TV show and everything. But my tastes are so warped because of this stupid <laughs> murderer in a bear costume. This murderer steals the, <laughs> the, the mascot of the college, this mm-hmm. bear costume, which is a silly with a long floppy tongue and big goofy eyes. Pre-Freddy takes four steak knives... 
and ties them together with tape to mm-hmm. make this like murder weapon slashing thing that would just rip your fingers off the moment you tried to use it. <laughs> Very impractical, stupid thing and sticks it through the bear's paw so that it's got like real metal claws and that that the stalking sequences in that movie which are very small compared to people talking about getting laid Mm -hmm. people making fart jokes Mm -hmm. and people breaking up with each other like really terrible horrible human beings in this movie uh but the stalking sequences became a huge thing for me and i just love that movie so much and it took me God, it took me a good 20 years to even know what it was. Yeah. (laughs) It was on a horror forum where I'm like, all I remember is the bear costume. And people are like, dude, girls night out. It sucks. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. And I find it. I'm like, this does not suck. Yeah. 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 Uh, When Brad and I covered it, it's one of my favorite episodes we ever did. When he and I covered it, we found out just how many times they could drop the love and spoonful Mm -hmm. (laughs) in on the soundtrack because the, the, the wraparound stuff is with the DJ the college DJ who was like 50 years old playing oldies and Mm -hmm. almost all the songs are love and spoonful (laughs) songs. You know, I've not seen that movie in years, years, years. I don't even know if it's out over here. I don't even know if I'll even put that. It had a DVD here. They did, um, shriek show, um, media blasters company. They did a guilty pleasures line and they did not make enough of these. They made this badass intro where this punk rock looking eighties chick is like putting get, getting her makeup ready, ready. Putting her makeup on in this freaking dingy bathroom with graffiti all over the walls, and she writes guilty pleasures in lipstick on the mirror, and that's the logo. And it is so cool. And then they made like two of them. <laughs> and I, I think it was that one and um the Roberta Findlay movie, um, Sisters, um, Blood Sisters. Oh, for God's sake. There you go, folks. Me Googling. Me Googling. But yeah, so I, I, I think it is lost now, like as far as anyone giving a shit on putting it on Blu-ray. And there's probably not enough interest. I would love if uh, Vinegar Syndrome would do it. It sounds like a, it sounds like a, like this, that's the sort of stuff that Vinegar Syndrome does you know it's like, exactly yeah and yeah, yeah. Uh, like i say i'm i'm sure I'm trying to remember i'm sure it was on one of those like old torrents that you used to get where it's like lesser known slashers and there was like a group of like 10 of them uh um, yeah. i'm sure it's just when you mentioned the bear costume and then the alternate <laughs> name so the uk name is what's what, what rung a bell with me the weird thing about it is like you mentioned like jallo and you know that I'm all about that, Jallo. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, there is that. Like, it's, I think all Jallo fans on some level are early slasher fans. I don't think all early slasher fans are necessarily Jallo fans. Do you know what I mean? There's that weird kind of separation between <laughs> yeah, you make yeah. that jump, but you can't make the jump backwards. So, Look at any horror movie review guide that was written in the 80s, mm-hmm. uh, particularly by people who either were at the grindhouse cinemas or were writing from the perspective of i'm going to rent every horror movie in this video store and review it the bait and switch bullshit that distributors were doing with giallo films so they're taking you know and at best you're going to get bay of blood yeah (laughs) but then you might get something like the one in my list that is marketed as a straight up horror film Mm mm-hmm and when you finally get around to watching it in 1986 or in its its re 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 release in like 1979, uh, you're gonna be fucking pissed. <laughs> you're like, okay, this is some badly dubbed. Well, I'm gonna put that in quotes. Badly dubbed. I love the dubbing, but like, it's just it's just so funny how people of that era were anti Giallo, mm-hmm. and it wasn't until Argento's stuff with like. Tenebre and Creepers that they started to get like, oh, these are horror movies. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So, so my second pick here um, is one that really formed my tastes. And uh, this is finally in my possession on Blu-ray after quite a long and expensive uh, <laughs> journey. Uh, but this one introduced me to two things. Uh, this was... Um, from the TV series Elvira's Mistress of the Dark. Mm-hmm. This was supposedly 80, 
three when this episode aired, but I'm pretty sure I was a little older than that uh, when I did see this film. Um, it's called The Torture Chamber of Dr. Sadism uh, from 1967. <laughs> I've never heard of this. So. A.K.A. Uh, the Blood Demon, <laughs> mm-hmm. which was, its, I believe, its video title for a long time. This introduced the late 60s uh, German wave of horror movies because this movie was so successful when it came out that it is also the only movie of the late 60s German wave of horror (laughs) films. They put a lot of work into this film and it bombed so Mm. bad that all of the plans for a like like a wave of German horror because they were in crimmy territory. They were heavy into the crimmies in the late 60s. Yeah, yeah. This was an anomaly. This was weird. So a guy named Harold Reinel, who had done some crimmies, um, directed this one. And it's Christopher Lee and uh, the beautiful Karen Dorr, uh, who was the wife of the director. And I just saw this film on Elvira. You know, she'd interrupt and make jokes, which you want. Mm-hmm. But there's a scene where she's running through a castle trying to get away from Christopher Lee who wants to sacrifice her uh, for his, his diabolical purposes. <laughs> and she goes into a room that is completely dark and she's standing, bracing herself against the door because something's pounding on the door. And then a, she hears a squeaking, like a, like a metallic squeaking. And this lantern is being lowered down and she's like watching it. And as the lantern goes down by her feet and further down, she's on a plank and the room has no floor, and down at the bottom is a bunch of um, vipers and snakes and oh, wow. bugs and um, spikes and skeletons of previous victims. And so she's bracing up against the door like, holy shit. And then the plank starts to recede oh. into the wall slowly. <laughs> so she's tiptoeing, and that scene of her, her – how can I phrase this? Her heaving bosom mm-hmm. and her terrified face and this – a very gnarly, nasty fate that she just barely survives. Spoiler alert. Um, it's just so beautiful. And the whole movie is just grotesque imagery and creepy gothic bullshit, cobwebs and fake bats and, you know, everything. And I just was entranced by this film that is a one off because if you look up German horror films, on uh, on IMDb and sort by year, there's this area where they didn't make shit. <laughs> I think maybe World War II had something to do with that. Possibly, possibly, maybe. But mm. yeah, they didn't make horror films forever, and that's why the the you know like the backyard splatter fests shot on video stuff that happened in the 80s is because they were desperate. These dudes were they loved horror, and they were like, why the fuck doesn't Germany make anything? Yep. And enter and so, necromantic. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah, that's, I was, I was kind of, I think I was thinking of, is it Andre Schnass? Is that his name? Uh, the dude who did like the, the, my brain, I should, I should do better than this. <laughs> ah, might as well Google it. Why not? Treat myself. <laughs> uh, let's see. Andre, I'm, I swear it's Schnass. Uh, but he made violent shit and he made zombie 90 and a bunch of other he's the one who did the sequel to Entropophagus the uh the 1999 one Entropophagus oh, 2000 yeah yeah movies like him like yeah like necromantic um your butcher guy that yeah. guy's on that's next level shit yeah because they had, the, they had a watch. weird they had a, a weird flux in the mini 80s i've got that as a, a bloody moon bloody moon yeah yeah that's, that's, blood that's, blood moon blood moon blood Blood Moon, Bloody Moon. I was trying. Um, that's the other one I was trying to remember. Ah, jeez. What was that? <laughs> I know the front cover. I can see it's got the circular saw on it. What? I'm about to raise Burning Moon. <laughs> Burning Moon. <gasps> I'm going to. Okay, I'm going to pretend that I totally remember that. No one will believe it. 1992. Okay, it's even later than I thought it was. So, I'm, yeah, I'm thinking of The Burning Moon, directed by Olaf Ittenbach. That's such a cool name. Exactly. So that, God, the, the Severin art for that is, um, it's just like a person being ripped down the middle. Mm-hmm. It's so beautiful. Uh, but, yeah, so stuff like that, 
coming out because there was this total drought yeah. of horror. And it's just so, I mean, I am glad that they were able to work through their trauma of the of World War II, mm-hmm. what happened because of them, to them, etc. We won't go into that. We won't <laughs> open that whole can of worms. But that damn Euro cult of Christopher Lee, Euro crypt of Christopher <laughs> Lee box set, dude, is so expensive. Get it at the Severance sale if you can. But just check out freaking Torture Chamber of Dr. Sadism. I, I, it really holds up. It really does. Um, Brad and I did an episode on it a while back. And it's just, oh man, it's just something special. Nice. <sighs> but the only thing more horrifying than a horror <laughs> film is yours truly in the 90s. Like just me as a person in the 90s. <laughs> Um, I was disappointed with what horror, what popular horror movies were out. Mm -hmm. Not the good shit that was obscure, that was, you know, that everyone loves now. But the the stuff that was hitting theaters can't, if it's your first horror film, if you were a kid in the 90s and it's nostalgic for you, that's great. For the rest of us, it felt like this garbage time to be into horror films. Where, like, the best thing that comes out is um, From Dusk Till Dawn Mm -hmm. that reminds you, oh, shit, horror is good. I forgot horror. Yeah. Uh, And and by the time I got into college in in the early 2000s, I was really into renting all the artsy movies and, and, you know, like, reading a lot of heavy, highbrow literature and stuff. So, horror, I, I never watched horror during that whole, like, God only knows, like, a decade of me just not watching horror films. <clears throat> one film that was a life preserver of horror that I loved so much. I even wrote a poem about it, which no, I will not be reading <laughs> the poem about it uh, to you guys. Cause that's, that's just hideous. But a, a little film I watched in the middle of the night on cable during college years that just kept the, the spark of um, freaking horror alive in my heart talking about, Night of the Demons from 1988. Nice. From our, our pal Kevin Tenney starring good old uh, Linnea Quigley. Yep. Oh, man. I would, then they, for whatever reason, um, I don't remember what, it was HBO or whatever cable channel it was. They just showed that. It must have been so cheap. They just <laughs> showed Night of the Demons and Night of the Demons 3 a lot. Mm-hmm. And um, 2 is magic too if you haven't seen either the demons two people i was getting muddled up is two the one with the is two the one with the nun yes yes two is amazing yes three is the one where the kids accidentally or sort of on purpose rob a liquor store yeah yeah that one is awesome but it's not good no <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i i highly recommend uh Nightmare, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, Night of the Demons too. But yeah, this movie is just, it has all of the grotesque effects. Mm-hmm. You have Linnea Quigley stealing every scene she's in. She's really good. Just what a joy. And the, because I watched a show uh, called Stephen King's World of Horror in the 80s. It was right at the tail end of the 80s. It was also called... Um, this is horror and it aired on mtv right before headbangers ball mm-hmm. so yes. i got my right before my metal fix i got my uh, horror fix and they just talked about horror movies and they'd interview people like kevin tenney and they'd interview people like uh, david dakotu and clive barker and stephen king and all this stuff and they did a special on um linea quigley and talked to her a bunch and the one movie that stuck out to me was uh, was Night of the Demons, so I rented it and was blown away. Mm-hmm. And it just kind of forgot about it until I kept seeing it on cable. And that was like the bridge that saved me from giving up on horror completely. It's a great one. I um, yeah, I've done a, a another show that I was on. We we went through all of them, and nice. I nice. like. I was late to that one, so I didn't see it when it came out. So I, I only saw it for the first time kind of early 2010s. And, nice. But nice. as you will as you will more than know, uh, there is a British movie called Night of the Demon from like the 50s, which... Yes. Like, like, so when these Americans are talking about that movie, I'm like that. They made a, 
how many movies off that one? No. <laughs> and then they're totally, I, I distinctly remember the, con- this is how we ended up doing it. I remember the conversation being, well, you know, the whole lipstick scene. And I'm like, Do are what we now? watching the scene? Like the, like the creature at the, the London <laughs> library. And they're like, what are you on about? I'm like, Night of the Demon. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, how come it like they're like you're the punk rockers and I'm like no this is before punk it's set in the 50s um, right. they're like no 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 so yeah so um, I had been and for years when the movie had been referenced <laughs> I was referring to a different movie so there you go <laughs> and then you have Night of the Demon yes which is also the uh, the, the Sasquatch movie yes so you have that too to really mu- it's a great original title for a film yeah <laughs> <laughs> I kind of skipped a little bit I want to talk about, which was th- this stuff, you know, influenced me, the early stuff I talked about, yeah. but th- the VHS days that This Is Horror, Stephen King's World of Horror show is why I've watched Evil Dead 10 times. Yeah. <laughs> is why I found out, oh, I should rent Hellraiser and Hellraiser 2. Mm-hmm. Speaking of movies, I had to turn off <laughs> and come sit and hang out with my parents because I had... They'd given me their hand-me-down VCR and my old TV, and I was so I was watching all these horror movies alone when I was, you know, ten or eleven, and I remember renting Hellraiser and Hellraiser two and just hitting stop. And Hellraiser is such an adult movie. It's it's and, like like oh so when they God. talk about adult horror movies, like I remember the the cover terrified me to Hellraiser, mm-hmm. and when I finally watched it, it like it is legitimately one of those movies where you instantly know, right, that this is not this is not this is not for your eyes, child. <laughs> I was just like, this is like this is dark shit. Yep. I walk out, sit with my folks while they're watching whatever sex comedy <laughs> and just they're just like, hey, what's going on? I'm like, nothing. <laughs> you okay? Yeah, yeah, just you know because if my mom knew had any idea what I was renting, mm-hmm. I would have never seen a horror film again. But luckily, um, their vague parenting skills uh, led me to to be able to ingest things like that all by myself. So it was great. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, stuff like uh, Reanimator. Mm-hmm. Um, one that I caught on cable that I still love to this day is Deadly Friend. Oh, nice. Although it is, um, it, it's not as good as I remembered this, as a kid, mm-hmm. uh, but I'm a, I'm still a big fan of that, especially that uh, weird almost rap song at the end with the, <laughs> the baby classic. So <laughs> let's get into a, a store that um, a conversation that led to me driving all the way across town here in Tampa. Uh, my buddy Nafa, former co-host of this show, mm-hmm. um, he was not fired. Sadly, has passed away, but a conversation he and I had in uh, around 2001-ish, we were talking about horror movies, and who knows, maybe I saw Night of the Demons again and got me all fired up about it. (laughs) But he was talking about a a store called Unique Video, and Unique Video was the most unusual video store. So you walked into this place, and the porno section was at the front door. Oh, wow. Wow. Because that's where they thought they would be stolen the least, is if you know people would be front, yeah. ashamed to look at them in the with the light from the street, you know, from the the windows coming in. So I guess that worked for them. <laughs> then it was like comedies, family movies, stuff like that. Then the horror was in the back, mm-hmm. and he got me all fired up about this place. And I just started reading about Italian horror. And I just like been like, oh, I've I've accidentally seen a couple of these back in the day. I didn't realize, you know, I'd seen Creepers, mm-hmm. and I'd seen um, what is the one I'd seen? Um, Entropophagus Two, aka Absurd, mm-hmm. which was almost one of my picks. Oh, was such, one such a good movie! TV. Such yeah, a good dude. movie. Love it. He he strongly encouraged I go to the store, and I got lost. It took my my girlfriend at the time and I um, like an hour and a half to find this store. <laughs> Because we have very confusing garbage street names here in Tampa. But we found it. And dude, the guy who run, ran the place, the, the proprietor was there. He was there watching Mountain of the Cannibal God. Holy fuck. <laughs> in the store while p- customers are there looking around at shit. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. And the, he and I struck up a conversation. It was very nice, very old man. It was not surprising at all to find out that he had... Not long after that, it passed away. Mm-hmm. But I rented 
Creepers, mm-hmm. aka Phenomena. Finally got to see Phenomena in one of its cuts, one of its longer cuts. Mm-hmm. I rented one from my childhood, which is also very traumatic, called Miss 45. Oh, yes. Yep, good old Abel Ferrara. Yep. Uh, I rented um, the Stendhal syndrome. Oh God. Speaking of speaking of sexual violence, <laughs> and and uh, this film, which I had read about but had never seen before, called Zombie, aka Zombie Two, aka Zombie Flesh Eaters yes. from 1979. Mm-hmm. Now, out of all the films that you know, because I, you know, I knew what I was getting into with with uh, phenomena, uh, but I did not see what <sighs> reading about zombie did not prepare me for the freight train <laughs> that it does to your mind, especially when you save it for the last film of the night. Oh yeah, yeah. At like one in the morning, I feel like she's just got a different gear. I think, yeah. I, I think, like especially then, he just seemed to be able to switch into a different gear compared to everyone else around him. Yeah. So, so the eyeball scene is, <laughs> without a doubt, important. You know what I mean? Like that eyeball scene is, you know, it's when Stephen Thrower included every screenshot, like second by second, of yeah. how that unfolds on the layout of his uh, book about Fulci. I, I will absolutely recognize its importance, but that scene does not affect me at all compared to the aftermath mm-hmm. when they're looking for the doctor's wife and they go into her little bungalow and they're standing there with her corpse and zombies feasting on her corpse and they go, oh shit, look over there. <laughs> and they all turn and see her being devoured. That fucked <laughs> me mm-hmm. up i was 20 god what year or so i guess i was 25 and that really fucked me up mm-hmm. and i still am drawn to that moment of what's this ruined woman's body and these things that are not they're not even interested in eating her they're just slowly boring bored just picking her apart like yeah I love that so much and I'm so repulsed by it. And it, (laughs) that is the, each of these films changed everything, you know, like just like your list, every, nothing was the same after that. Yeah. And I'm not a gore hound now. I still love when a film goes there, Mm -hmm. but that flipped that switch of, I need gore. I need it all the time. What the fuck? Oh my god! Like this is great. And I just like ugh, like that just hit me so hard. And and of course my love of Fulci, I still love him more than both Argento and Bava. Um, you know, the out of the trilogy of those wonderful Godfathers of Italian horror cinema, he's all Fulci. I always come back to him. Never ceases to amaze me. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the it's the Fulci fallout is what I call it because when once you've experienced. Once you're like specifically that run of movies, if you're if you're coming fresh to either zombie flesh eaters, um, uh, City of the Living Dead, Beyond, uh, House by the Cemetery, if you're watching any one of those without having seen any of the others for the first time, it's like becoming a zombie. It's like you you want to devour <laughs> you want to devour them all. And it's just right. like I I. I because I, I, as, as, when you check out his whole career he's a guy who found his, his niche very late on he was like a jack of all trades doing everything else but as soon as he found that well I can make a career out of this <laughs> like, and be with but the thing is like, what I love about him is it's so that movie is so close to I mean it's ostensibly a rip off of Dawn of the Dead but so close to Dawn of the Dead but it's unlike all the other Italian rip off movies which are essentially just just <laughs> remake that again he puts his own spin on it and he he really elevates the nastiness and gnarliness of it to a point where oh, yeah. he out, he almost out you know kind of out zombies Romero which is <laughs> You know what I mean? It, uh, j- just by doing his his version of doing things, which it feels like it's just off to the side. I'm the same as you. The first time I saw, and I was never the biggest fan of Zombie Flesh Eaters. The first couple of times I saw, I always thought it was okay, but I was more into like specifically movies like The Beyond. That's where I kind of grappled on with. 
in the last five, six years, I've seen zombie flesh eaters more than the other movies now. Wow. And that's through choice. And there's nice. something that's it, like recently it's just connected more with me that I grasp just how ahead of the time, specifically for the time period when that movie came out, how he was just doing yeah. things on a completely different level to everyone else. It's fucking great. It it came down to uh, zombie or the beyond. Like yeah. I really wanted to kind of like choose something that uh, I'm passing my wife a very secret note here. <laughs> um, so the, it's not about you. It's not about you. <laughs> no. Uh, I think he's Scottish. Was, um, so <laughs> the cat's out of the bag now. No, but zombie really changed everything, and the and the beyond uh, honestly was also another. Yeah, you know that I was never normal again after. Yeah. That, even though I did not appreciate the beyond mm-hmm. as, as much as I did l- in later viewings, I I knew I enjoyed it, but I still was like, huh, shoot him in the head, dumbass. Yeah. And that, like, that took, like, that weirdness of even, like, just the strange shit, like, you know, the do not entry sign. Yeah. Like, stuff like that. I'm like, this is so dumb. But the final film, the last film, um, would kind of change the course of my, my film going life. And not kind of, it just did. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a Giallo. Mm-hmm. And I, this is not the first Giallo I ever saw, uh, but it was the one that really got me into what I call the vibe. The vibe I've talked about for years now is that very hard to describe. It's like this weird, morbidly beautiful, like sensation. That's really hard to pin down. Um, It usually involves something, especially from the Italians, something grotesque happening that should not be happening, but in a a space that's well lit and beautiful. Mm Mm-hmm. And so it's focusing your attention on this and it leaves you kind of breathless and like, wow, like it's this weird thing that just because the Italians, they're making cheap stuff. And a lot of times all they had were these old castles that had no (laughs) decoration because they were abandoned. So they're all whitewashed (laughs) walls with nothing. And so all this stuff is happening. Daria Nicolodi uh, walking down the stairs in mm-hmm. shock like that is vibe if you don't feel anything when you see that scene then you need to do some more work i'm not yeah. saying give up <laughs> keep trying but yeah so so this movie really left me with that feeling and it's it's such a strange film it is called the night evelyn came out of her grave oh nice from 1971 directed by the one and the only emilio miraglia miraglia mm-hmm. i have purchased this film four times <laughs> over the years just to, so you guys know how much i'm committed to how like how important this film is to me and i cannot stand people talking shit about this movie mm-hmm. Or it's star Anthony Steffen. There's an audio commentary that exists that the person's not a big fan of the movie. Okay. <laughs> and to listen to someone who doesn't like the film talk about and be critical of it on a commentary track is beyond my best, par- like the best parts of my personality. They're not that great. Like I yeah. can't, like I can't, but I'm, I'm talking too much already about it, but <laughs> Um, I adore that film and it is so strange and so silly and gothic weirdness, sexy, like speaking of sexual violence again, Mm -hmm. like conflicting hero, like conflict, not even a conflicted hero, a fucking evil hero. Yeah. Like a pile of garbage hero that is, is triumphant. (laughs) In the end, who doesn't deserve to not, like, forget having, like, massive amounts of wealth and a, and a lo- lovely lifestyle, like a hip 60s, 70s <laughs> playboy lifestyle. Motherfucker should be in jail yeah. at the very least, if not outright killed at the end of the movie. <laughs> but, like, the way it wraps up, the, the, the big set piece ending with certain characters who are lovely Mm -hmm. lovely ladies Mm -hmm. pitted against each other in this chic 
apartment, this white, beautiful space that looks like something Kubrick would have built. Mm -hmm. It just got to me in a way that I've been struggling to describe in words and failing for many years. (sighs) Like, without The Night Evelyn Came Out of Her Grave, which also was one of those hilariously misleading horror posters that... (laughs) No, no, no. (laughs) Um, That without that film, I wouldn't have found things like uh, 1981's Murder Obsession Mm -hmm. by Ricardo Freda as special as I do. Um, I wouldn't have found Zader, aka Revenge of the Dead, by uh, my my boy Poopy Mm -hmm. Avati. I wouldn't. That wouldn't hypnotize me. Where if I put on Zader. You can't talk to me. (laughs) I am just like in the zone. Like that movie. I'm. I'm. Seriously, folks, I'm getting a little teary thinking Mm. about this subject. Like this is so important to me. I never, ever want to stop searching for vibe movies. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like, it's just so important. Like phenomena by good old Argento. That whole sequence where Jennifer is in the lair of the killer Mm -hmm. and it's just this weird whitewashed gray nothingness space Mm -hmm. and the or or the the killer's um domicile in frickin tenebre yeah yeah oh yeah that shit is so specific and and i don't even know like it's just oh it's beautiful but yeah that's long story short too late this movie (laughs) (laughs) I might have rambled there. I can't tell. No, 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 no. Um, I, you know, I've not watched. That's one I've not watched in years, um, and I don't mm-hmm. know why I have it. It's somewhere amongst the, <laughs> the collection. Um, it's, it all uh, started with that public domain copy that was pan and scanned, like so- sourced from a VHS on on a DVD that was on like those big horror movie packs that were yeah. like you know five bucks at Walmart here. Hmm. Hmm. There is, I, I think that's the, isn't that a, a, to an extent, that's one of the the exciting things about being fan of like Italian cinema in general is all those, you, you can find those scenes that you're talking about, like specifically just those one shots that you're just like, this is absolutely incredible that come out of nowhere in movies that you don't always expect them to come from. And I think those are the bits where, like, I think that's why through time I've only grown more fascinated by their, you know, like that that kind of what twenty five year period of cinema where everything just seemed to be, oh my god, so like the the content was coming out. They would follow whatever you know, Jalo, you know, becomes uh, the police detective movies and. Um, and all the way through, like the, you can track those things through, but there's always those, even if the movie's hot garbage and it's a complete rip-off, there's always that, there'll always be that one scene where you're like, this score, this visual, this yes. shot is just, Music. everything just like matches right up and it's a perfect moment. Yeah. Um I yeah. thank you for saying the music. I mean, the score for yeah. Night of Evelyn Came Out of Her Grave is outrageously good. Yeah. yeah. I think, but it, it also happens that you've got, you've got some of the best composers ever working, some of the best cinematographers <laughs> ever working, some of the, you know, the most creative uh, script writers and directors, all in this one country, all working at the same time, all sharing resources. It's, it's so crazy. I don't think there's ever been as a as fertile a ground for collaborative work in cinema ever. And it just so happened to all land in that one period. It's nuts. Well, it's kind of like we had a similar thing when they made, uh, in America, they made Dumb and Dumberer, the sequel (laughs) to Dumb and Dumber. I think that's probably close to that level of talent. It's up there. It's up there. Like I I always equate it to, there's that weird time period and, it's not even necessarily weird, but it's, I think we, we put too much emphasis on the masters of horror from the American standpoint of yeah. when people are like, well, you well you had Romero and you had Craven, you had Carpenter, you had Gordon, um, yep. you know, and this Friggin was all Toby that, Hooper, Toby Hooper, and I'm like, yeah, well, you did, but they are also spaced out. 
Like, yes. Craven's 92, Romero, yeah. what was late 60s, early 70s, yeah. uh, Hooper's mid 70s and onwards, Carpenter's late 70s, realistically, is late 70s and onwards. Yeah. Um, Stuart Gordon didn't start making movies to the mid 80s. So you're talking, like, in terms of a period of time, that's a big golf. It's almost 20 years. Where yeah, we're, we're not talking a, about, we're not talking about 1972 Italy. Yes, where, where everyone's like, doing stuff. Shit. That's that's. I think that's the difference. Like when, <laughs> well, like when you bring that up in the conversation, people go, "Well, we had all these." You did have all those directors, but there is yeah. a big period of time in between when they hit what they're considered to be their stride. But and like you say, in 1972, you still have you still have Bava making super interesting stuff. Uh, Argento's just starting to hit his peaks. Uh, Fulci's making movies. Sergio Martino's making movies. Yeah. Uh, Aldo Lado is making movies you know like and the list goes on of people yeah. that are all active and it's not just like a one and then they're not like active as in making maybe two three movies that year <laughs> so, whoa whoa absolutely not so uh... well folks i can't stress enough to if you don't already know who duncan is now you do but hi <laughs> <laughs> this guy, so I first, I didn't listen to the podcast Under the Stairs until way after I'd heard pretty much every single Doing the Nasty oh, episode <laughs> back in the Andy days, when mm-hmm. it was you and Andy. Yep. And I fell in love with, obviously, you oh. and Sexy Andy, but mm-hmm. um, I love your work. It, it, you were such a dedicated a wildly prolific podcaster. So let's let's run this down. So I'm going to say what I which ones I know about. Mm-hmm. So I know about Podcast Under the Stairs, which has its its tendrils and lots of sub shows, mm-hmm. not in quality, but like you know, like a uh, spinoff shows, uh, like Opera Om- Om- Opera Omnia, which I've been on. Mm-hmm. Thank you. <laughs> um, and also uh, your your. Your Baz V Horror series, yep, with your with your boy Baz, mm-hmm. and then you have Chronicle, yes, and now you have I'm going to butcher this one. <laughs> it's the one I'm not going to say the name. It's the one where you're talking about where to start with things, yeah, uh, where where to begin with, where to begin. That's it, yeah. And then there's Jaws's Shite. Yeah, Jaws is Shite and other regrettable outbursts. And that's Baz's. That's you and the Baz back. Yeah, right. it's, it's it's not it's not movie based at all. It's uh, it's okay. It, it's about regrettable life choices. So we get drunk. <laughs> oh my god! Uh, hence the hence the name. One of the one of the co hosts on that show um, from the from the other Glasgow based, well, so the other Scotland based horror show, Scotland Liam versus Evil. Uh, when we yes. met them for the first time, it was at a horror debate. Uh, for a like a horror convention and we'd never met these guys before and we all got very drunk beforehand because scotland and um we went on stage and we put a lot of prep in to defeat them in the uh, in the debate and then scott uh very cleverly on stage in front of a horror crowd said i was talking he was talking about remakes um and he, he said, oh, they can remake. I mean, I've never seen Jaws. I mean, for all I know, Jaws could be shite. Uh, and the crowd turned <laughs> the crowd turned on him really, really quickly. And I'd I said, bet. I turned to Baz at the time and said, we don't need to take these guys down. They're going to take themselves down. Um, but that's, <laughs> where the, that's where the name of the show comes from. It's a regrettable oh, a, a regrettable life choice, a regrettable oh, outburst. My. So, yeah, it's a, it's a, a kind of drunken mess of a show. Um, and we get nice. more Scottish the longer it goes on, which means we're more unintelligible to listen to. So uh, Of that course, well. <laughs> you've, al- you've also been doing stuff with our boy Bo. You've yeah. You've been doing the slash fiction for a while, covering every episode of the show called Slasher. Which, right? oh my good god yeah so that's for Duncan and Bo come correct which has been yes that show's been on the go since 2014 and I can't oh my, believe has that has it been that long yeah yeah like oh the my first, god that's amazing first two seasons of that are me and Bo picking movies against each other that the other one hadn't seen and okay. then agreeing at the end who had the better selection and then it kind of morphed into doing TV shows so we've done a couple of seasons of Westworld. Twin Peaks. Twin, yeah. We did the entirety of Twin Peaks, including the books and the movie. Um, nice. And we've done we've done X Files, and for some wow. reason, 
unbeknownst to me, uh, Bo decided that we would do Slasher. Uh, it's mostly because <laughs> the new season of Slasher comes out in August and David Cronenberg's in it. So that's what's that's what okay uh, that i didn't know yeah that is what started us on the journey because we're like i know it's an anthology show but maybe we should get ourselves up to date with slasher before <laughs> we watch the one with david cronenberg in it so um so yes yeah, so i do i do that as well podcast under the stairs has been on the go since 2013 it's currently sitting about 925 episodes Good God. So um, it's oh, the most active God. one. The other ones are on a, yeah. a separate channel. Uh, but yeah, I, I keep busy. Like uh, Richard was saying, he was on season two of Opera Omnia, which looks exclusively at one director's body of work. And we did Peter Strickland, which was a ton of fun. That Super so enjoyed good. that. Um, and the new season of that is looking at David Fincher and Bo's on that. So we're about halfway through. Um, a run of Fincher films so yeah I, I mean like I say this has been a long time coming um, yeah. you're legitimately one of my favourite voices in podcasting Thank I absolutely you. love the nonsense uh, and you have slowly infected my lexicon with uh, w- w- with a little bit of more bava um, <laughs> uh, y- y- you know what I mean uh, Lambert oh, and bava. I, do. Uh, I actually like off the back of getting to know you started seeking out more of Lambert Obama's work because I was one of those people that really only knew him from demons. Yeah. Um and having having listened to you talk about him the way you did, uh and uh, I I did I did have a chance to check out some of his uh shall we see some more of his violent work from the 80s like I'd never seen a blade in the dark before and that oh, movie wow. is a violent as fuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I put that down to you. So hey, Lamb Baba has a way about him. It's he's mm-hmm. yeah, it's he's definitely not trying to be his dad. Oh, hundred percent not. He just <laughs> was doing something so strange and and so like they're like people are down on him and I can't I can't I don't even entertain it anymore. I just walk away because yeah. I can't explain to them what makes him so special. It's like well, yeah. it's that thing where you're like, do you want him like, like you like, had he been more like his dad, you would just moan that he's like his dad. Yeah, you know what I mean. I, I like that idea of him going off and doing his his one thing. Plus, like Mario Bava, as much as some of those movies do get a bit violent and all the rest. Like, he would always insert that degree of humour to defuse the situation. Like, because he didn't want, he didn't want to be known as that. Lamberto yeah. Bava does not. <laughs> no, he doesn't he care. He <laughs> You can't even tell when he's joking because the dubbing is so weird. Like, I mean, th- like, freaking, there might be intentional jokes in A Blade in the Dark, but who knows? I mean, yeah. from what I've heard, the, the Italian version is very serious and that the something happened from... The, the tr- with the translation for the dubbers that made the film so silly and so mm. quotable you know like um that's not a that's not a spider that's a cockroach yeah <laughs> and it's clearly a spider and you're like what is wrong with this guy <laughs> but to, no dude you are super inspiring and you, i i love your positivity uh, as we talked about i think before we started recording that mm-hmm. uh you're not going to waste your time recording an episode on a film you want to pick apart no and no. trash you know like the doom show has a very small handful of things that um we didn't like like yeah. usually it's it's me trying to make brad laugh with um uh oh my god what's that movie called <laughs> got my brain today Jeez. <laughs> um soul survivors um, I oh. thought he was going to find that so funny and he hated it. And it was like just this, I it was this epic two hour goof fest and it turned into like less than an hour of him going, I didn't like this at all, man. Like, why did you pick this? <laughs> and, and then like Jeffrey and I getting confused because I'll pick something that he just mentioned exists. Mm-hmm. And my brain says, oh, he's picking that to do an episode on. So next thing you know, I'm like, dude, let's do it next week. And he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and he doesn't say, I've never seen it. I just want you to know it exists. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, we're four or five pages of notes deep mm-hmm. into every scene. And he goes, I did not pick this garbage. Yeah. You did. And I'm like, you no, <laughs> no, you did. So very few of that, you know, very little of that. And and even if it's something we're ripping apart, we probably love it mm-hmm. <laughs> you know like uh that that's it's it's the old uh 
I, I mean, I've had people like me, like uh, write to me, like very rare feedback we get, uh, where someone was like, I was so mad at you for uh, how much you hated Nightmare City. But then at the end, you guys are both loved it. Yeah. And we're like, oh, yeah, that's kind of how we roll. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, like I said before, like there's a like even the grading the grading system on podcasts under the stairs is like the old Netflix style of grading. So it's mm-hmm. like hated it, didn't like it, really liked it. It's not technical grades. Like the movie could be the worst constructed. Once again, pieces. It could be a movie which I like. I genuinely think pieces should be shown to film students as a way to show. Like, this is not how you make a movie. But, but <laughs> yes, that's what makes it so great. That's like, like on an entertainment and enjoyment level, like, they don't get much better than that. Nope. Like, so, like, you can, you can, like, to me, you can disassociate those two things and pick it apart for bad cinematography. You know, the acting's right. not that great. This is a huge plot hole. But at the end of it, if you feel good, if it entertains you, then it gets a positive grade because. Yeah. There are plenty of movies out there that sole job is to entertain that can't do that. So <laughs> Exactly. Uh, well, dude, thank you so much for, for taking the time to hang out. I'm glad we got this going on. Mm-hmm. And, and now, um, like, this is you getting back at me for poisoning uh, your <laughs> listeners' ears with my nightmare voice. Because so I think the first thing I did on your show was uh, The Black Cat. We did two black. We did um, yes, that and uh, two evil eyes. Two evil eyes. That's right. Yeah. Um, wow. We we back in the day. I, I loved that. I loved that as well. Because trust me, I, like there was a short, 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 short list of people that would come on and discuss those movies. So like, what's it you want to do? No, I'm not doing that. Like, come on, it'll be fun. I'm not doing that. Well, you know who'll do that? Richard will do that. And you that's did. right. So, and that's years ago now. I can't say no to you like, no matter what it is. That so. might be four years ago now. Wow. Yeah. Okay. We've so. we've had uh, our bulges straining against our pants this whole time. <laughs> no. And now it's released on the Doom Show. Yay. <laughs> Excuse me. They are released. Are both bulges. We don't share a yeah. bulge yet. No. Give it time. <laughs> I need to hit stop on the recording. But anyway... Folks, thanks for listening, and a second round of thanks to Duncan. Please check out all of his shows. Podcast Under the Stairs is just the tip of the iceberg. It is, if you like that Scottish brogue up in your ear holes, there's a couple more hours of it out there. <laughs> Hello, This is the Doom Show is a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Please check out the other podcasts on legionpodcasts.com. If you'd like more Hello, This is the Doom Show, go to hellodoomshow.podomatic.com or go to doomedmoviethon.com for the archives. If that's...